In this Math 2203 video, we're going to take a look at matrices of linear transformations. We're going to take a look at how to represent a linear transformation T from Rn to Rm as a matrix. We're going to call that matrix A sub T. We'll see how to do some calculations, how to find the kernel, the range, rank, and nullity of our linear transformation using that matrix representation. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about matrix representations for compositions of linear transformations and inverses of linear transformations. We're going to start off the video with a couple of theorems. Theorem 1 says if we have a linear transformation from Rn to Rm, then there exists a unique matrix, we're going to call that matrix A sub T, such that T acting on a vector V is equal to the matrix multiplication AT times V. To prove Theorem 1, first I'm going to deal with the uniqueness aspect. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider the standard basis of Rn. And we're going to consider the vectors in Rm. We're going to call them w1, w2 up to wn. And w1 is t of e1. w2 is t of e2. All the way up to wn is t of en. If we select the vectors in this way, by a theorem that we've seen in the properties video, t is a unique linear transformation. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to set up the matrix A sub T. So specifically, we're going to say that A sub T is going to be the matrix that has these columns, W1, W2, up to Wn. And we're going to define a map, AT, from Rn to Rm. And we're going to define it in such a way that AT of a vector in Rn is equal to the multiplication AT times V. So next what we want to do is we want to figure out what A sub T looks like as a matrix, or what these columns of AT look like. So we have to describe the vectors W1 up to WN. Now W1 up to WN, they don't have any special properties necessarily, they're just vectors inside of the vector space Rm. So they're going to have M entries, and I'm just going to label them in a nice way so that A comes out to be kind of our usual M by N matrix. Next, what we're interested in is we're interested in how AT acts on our basis B. So I'm just going to set up this equation. I want AT to act on one of those standard basis vectors. And when AT acts on one of these standard basis vectors, we can represent that as multiplication on the left by this matrix that we set up on the last board. So here is what I call EI. EI has a 1 in the ith row. And when we do this multiplication, when we multiply the rows by this column vector, we just end up with a 1i, uh, a2i, all the way up to ami. And this is really just uh, our vector that we started out with wi. So what we've shown is we've shown that AT as a map, it sends that standard basis to a collection of vectors in Rm, W1 to Wn. And it does it in a very specific way. So it sends the first standard basis vector to W1 and the last standard basis vector to Wn. And so it matches everything up in a nice one-to-one -one way. So from that theorem, from the properties section, AT must be that unique linear transformation. Uh, but the, the issue we get here is that T does the exact same thing. T is a linear transformation that sends our basis B to those same vectors in Rm, and it matches them up in the exact same way that AT does. So in actuality, we can't have two of these unique linear transformations. They must actually be the same linear transformation. So it's, we get that T is equal to A sub T, so we have that we can represent T acting on V as matrix multiplication on the left by AT. So because we really haven't defined this AT yet, we're going to call A sub T the standard matrix representation of our linear transformation T. Next, I want to talk to you about the usefulness of theorem 1. So why would we care about representing a linear transformation as matrix multiplication? Well, remember how nice and easy it was for us to talk about the rank of a matrix or the row space or column space of a matrix? Theorem 2 says if A sub T is that matrix representation of a linear transformation T, then the following four things are true. The range of T is equal to 
the column space of our uh, matrix representation. The kernel is equal to the null space of our matrix transformation. And the rank of T and the nullity of T are equal to the rank of our standard matrix and the nullity of our standard matrix. So let's start out with a proof of number one. So let B be any vector in Rm. B is inside the range of our linear transformation if and only if we can write the following expression. T of V is equal to B for some vector in Rm. And we can, of course, represent T of V as matrix multiplication on the left-hand side by A sub T. Now, there was a theorem in 1201. Um, alternatively, you could actually expand out this multiplication here as a linear combination of the columns, in this case, of A sub T. And since B can be expressed as this linear combination of column vectors from our standard matrix, this implies that B is inside the column space of our standard matrix. So what we've done is we've started with a vector in the range and showed that that vector also has to be inside the column space of AT. So we've shown that the range is contained inside of the column space. If you start at the end of this proof and work backwards, you can show that the column space is actually contained within the range. And this is going to imply that the range of T is equal to the column space of A sub T. To show that the kernel of T is equal to the null space of our standard matrix is a little bit easier than what we had to do for the range. So here I'm just going to write the kernel of our linear transformation T as a set. So what is the kernel? Well, the kernel is the set of all vectors in Rn such that T maps this vector to the zero vector of Rm. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that we can write T as matrix multiplication on the left. So I'm just going to rewrite this expression so T of V is really equal to A sub T times our vector V. So now what we have is we have the set of all vectors V and Rn that satisfy this homogeneous system. And we know that that is the null space of this particular matrix A sub T. For part three, we know that the range of T is equal to the column space of our standard matrix. Uh, this is going to imply that as um, subspaces, they have the same number of basis vectors. So the dimension of the range of our linear transformation should be equal to the dimension of the column space of the standard matrix. And the dimension of the range, we define that to be the rank of our linear transformation. And the dimension of the column space of our standard matrix is the rank of A sub T. And finally, doing the same kind of procedure for the kernel and the null space is going to yield the proof for property 4 here. So as subspaces, they're going to have the same number of basis vectors. So dimension of the kernel is equal to the dimension of the null space. We've defined the dimension of the kernel to be the nullity of our linear transformation T. And the dimension of the null space of our matrix representation is going to be the nullity of A sub T. So let's tie those last two theorems up with a nice example here. We're going to take T from R3 to R3 as a linear transformation defined in the following way. And what we want to do is we would like to determine what the standard matrix looks like. And we're going to use the standard matrix to compute the range, the kernel, the rank, and the nullity of our linear transformation T. So what we want to do first is we want to form our standard matrix. We would like to figure out what that matrix looks like. Uh, and once we do that, it really boils down to just uh, row reducing that matrix and then using our row echelon form or reduced row echelon form to talk about the column space and the null space of A sub T. So I want you to just flip back to the proof of theorem number one. How do we form A sub T? Well, in theorem one, what we did was we took the standard basis of our first vector space and we mapped it through the uh, linear transformation T. And we ended up with these vectors W1 up to Wn. So what we have to do to start this question uh, is we have to look at our first vector space, which is R3. 
And we have to find the standard basis of that vector space. So I've written out the standard basis as b at the very bottom here. And our first step is to uh, compute where those standard basis vectors go through the linear transformation t. So let's compute t at our first basis vector 1, 0, 0. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that relationship that was given in the question. We're going to sub in x equals 1, y equals 0, and z equals 0. And you should get this um, vector here, 2, 4, minus 6. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the same procedure for each of these three standard basis vectors. So for example, here we'll have x equals 0, y equals 1, z equals 0. x equals 0, y equals 0, and z is equal to 1. And to form our standard matrix, what we're going to do is we're just going to call this W1, that becomes the first column. This here is W2, that becomes the second column of our standard matrix. And finally, um, our third basis vector will lead us to the third column of our standard matrix A sub T. What I'd like for you to do next is pause the video here and do some elementary row operations on this standard matrix to reduce it down to reduced row echelon form. So just double check your operations and make sure you get 1 minus 1 half and 3 halves in that first row. So this is our reduced row echelon form of our standard matrix. So what do we have here? We have only one leading one. What we want to do is we would like to find the range of our linear transformation T the range is equal to the column space. So because we have only one leading one in the reduced row echelon form, this column up here is going to form the basis for the column space of AT. Or another way of saying it is that this vector 2, 4, minus 6, if we span this vector, that's going to be equal to the column space or the range of our linear transformation. Since we have only one basis vector inside of our column space, it means that the rank of our linear transformation t is going to be equal to 1. Once we know the rank, we can actually very quickly calculate the nullity of our linear transformation just by using the dimension theorem. And the last thing I'm going to do here is figure out what the kernel of our linear transformation is. So I'm going to label each of these columns as x1, x2, x3 respectively. We already know that we should have two parameters because our nullity is equal to 2. We only have this leading one right here. So x2 I'll set equal to t, x3 I'll set equal to s. Of course t and s are real numbers. So our general solution for our null space is going to look like this. So our null space consists of all of the vectors of this particular form. And if we break this up into um, a piece containing t, we'll have 1 half, 1, and 0. And a piece containing s, that piece containing s will be negative 3 by 2, 0, and 1. These are going to be our basis vectors. So here and here we know that those are going to form the basis for our null space. These vectors are also going to form the basis for the kernel of the linear transformation t. So theorem 3 here says if we have two linear transformations, the first one is t going from rn to rk, and the second one is s going from rk to rm, and we know that T and S have standard matrices, A sub T, A sub S. Then the standard matrix of the composition of these two linear transformations is going to be the matrix AS times AT. Theorem 4 is also a really nice theorem. So if T um, is a linear transformation from RN to RN, um, also we have to assume here that T is invertible. And let's assume that T has the standard matrix A sub T. Then the standard matrix of T inverse, which also goes from Rn to Rn, is going to be found by just taking the inverse of our standard matrix of T. 